Welcome to Eggs and Issues, a monthly business program presented by the Portland Community Chamber with presenting sponsors, Bank of America, Martins Point Healthcare, and WAX. In cooperation with IDEX Laboratories, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, and Oxford Networks. And television sponsor, WMTW News 8, with production support by Headlight Audiovisual. And now, please welcome the Portland Community Chamber President, Bill Becker of Key Private Bank. Well, good morning, and welcome to Eggs and Issues. This is the Portland Community Chamber's monthly business forum, where we gather to discuss business issues of the day. My name is Bill Becker, Vice President, Key Private Bank, and Volunteer President of the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. Our special guest today is Maine's Governor, Paul LePage. Governor LePage, it is an honor to have you with us again, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts on the issues facing Maine today. Before we begin, I'd like to speak to you on behalf of the PCC Board of Directors. On June 10th, Portland voters will decide whether Congress Square Plaza is transformed into an engine of new economic growth, or whether it stays as it is today, a failed urban space. The Portland Community Chamber of Commerce has supported plans to redevelop Congress Square Plaza for three years, so it's no surprise that we are also participating in Forward Portland, a political action committee formed to support a no on question one on June 10th. The sale of the plaza went through all of the required planning board, public hearing, city council, public comment processes, with the council voting to move forward. This referendum would undo three years of public process and give developers ample reason to pause before bringing projects to Portland again. We applaud the Portland City Council for its recently passed ordinance that further protects public parks keeping with 20 years of council efforts to add open space, create trails, and expand public access to recreational activities in the city. Make no mistake, question one on June 10th in Portland is an effort to shut down investment in Congress Square Plaza, nothing more. However, a no vote on question one supports jobs, the growth of small business in and around Congress Square Plaza, and will create a more vibrant public space in the whole of Congress Square. A yes vote does not add protections to our parks. Instead, it only maintains a single failed urban space in the heart of the city. Please visit portlandforward.com or take a look at the handout on your table to learn more, to contribute, and to volunteer. Most importantly, spread the word Urge your friends and neighbors to vote no on question one on Portland, in Portland on June 10th, and make sure you vote. Together, let's keep economic development and jobs moving forward in Portland and in the region. Thank you. Now I'd like to offer a few words about our sponsors. Our program is made possible through the generous support of our sponsors, all of them leaders in the greater Portland business community. Please hold your applause until I have mentioned all of them. Presenting sponsors, Bank of America, Martins Point Healthcare, and WEX. Cooperating sponsors, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, IDEX, and Oxford Networks. Reception sponsors, Clark Insurance and Key Bank. Overall production support of Eggs and Issues is provided by Headlight Audiovisual, and our program is broadcast by our friends at Time Warner Channel to Cables On Demand on channels 1, 950, 1040. It's great to have a chance to see our speakers again, and I use it to figure out what tie I wore last month. <laughs> the print spo our print sponsor is The Forecaster. Our e-media partner is Main Biz. Our radio sponsor is WGAN. And our broadcast partner is WMTW-TV. We also thank our special community partners, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Northeast Dental, Delta Dental, and the Portland Press Herald, Maine Sunday Telegram, PressHerald.com. Now, please join me in thanking all of our sponsors for their generous support of Eggs and Issues. <laughs> our Tomorrow's Leaders program allows high school students to attend Eggs and Issues during the academic year. We'd like to thank our sponsors, AAA Northern New England and Springborn Staffing for their support of this program. We would like to welcome many students to our event this morning. With us, we have students from LearningWorks, Chevrus, Catherine McCauley, 
Falmouth, and Portland high schools. Students, would you please stand and be recognized? We also want to thank Springborn Staffing and AAA Northern New England for their support of our program, Tomorrow's Entrepreneurs. This program allows students from Southern Maine Community College's Entrepreneur Program to attend Eggs and Issues for free. SMCC students and staff, please stand to be recognized. Baker Newman Noyes sponsors our Community Corner program, which allows area nonprofits to promote their organizations at Eggs and Issues. Our Community Corner partner this month is the Muscular Dystrophy Association. MDA is the world's leading nonprofit health agency dedicated to finding treatments and cures for muscular dystrophy, ALS, and other neuro neuromuscular diseases. It does so by funding worldwide research, by providing comprehensive health care services and support to MDA families nationwide, and by rallying communities to fight back through advocacy, fundraising, and local engagement. Locally, the MDA of Maine provides services to over 600 families in our state. Services include clinics at Maine Medical Center and Eastern Maine Medical Center, support groups, loan closets for durable medical equipment, and the best week of the year, summer camp. All funds raised locally are done so through special events, including lockups, mobile campaigns, and the muscle walk. With us today from the MDA is Executive Director Ashley King and Healthcare Services Coordinator Amber Pelletier. Additionally, the President and General Manager of the CN Brown Company, Ginger Durier, and Jeff Jones and who's uh, from CN Brown, whose employees and, com um, and company fundraised over $250,000 last year for the MDA of Maine. Would you all please stand to be recognized? Great work. Now we want to take some time to recognize any new chamber members who are with us this morning. You'll see their names on the screen in front of you. New members, if you're here, please stand and be recognized as well. Welcome to the chamber. We are also proud to welcome members of our Portland Veterans Network our comprehensive free program for unemployed and student veterans focusing on jobs, wellness, educational, and networking opportunities. We'd like to extend a special thank you to Easter Seals of Maine, who has partnered with the Chamber to maintain and promote the Veterans Support Network. Following Governor LePage's remarks, we'll have a question and answer session. For this portion of the event, please use the microphone closest to your table to pose your question, not your comment. Please introduce yourself and tell us the name of your company or organization. Please keep your questions brief and nonpartisan. And now on to our speaker, Governor Paul LePage. A business leader who served his community as, of Waterville as mayor, Paul LePage decided to run for governor, believing that the successful approach that had guided him throughout his business career and in Waterville could work for all of Maine. Governor LePage received his undergraduate degree from Husson College and also attended the University of Maine where he earned an MBA. His story of personal success and his fiscally conservative values are well known, and he carried those messages through a seven-way Republican primary and a five-way general election to become Maine's governor on January 5th, 2011. Please join me in giving a warm Portland welcome to our governor, Paul LePage. Thank you, Bill, and good morning. It's an honor to be here. It's always a, a great pleasure to get to Portland. In fact, I just left. I was here last night. <laughs> what I'd like to do this morning is spend a, a couple of minutes telling you where we've been the last four years, sort of encapsulate the administration, talk about some of our successes, some of the work that's still ahead of us, and some of our what I consider major failures. And I, and I would say that the major failure in the last two years is due to 
the same type of gridlock here in Augusta that we have in Washington. Truly unfortunate. But despite all that, we've lowered the unemployment rate from 8.2% down to 5.9, one of the lowest in the country right now. We've created over 18,000 new jobs. We've paid our hospitals $750 million. Very proud of having paid the hospitals. And believe it or not, while it may sound like it should have been real easy, it's probably one of the toughest things we did, we're able to get through. There again, that was the major push to get jobs in Maine, is to pay in our bills. And I don't know if you've been reading the papers lately, I don't, but some people do, they report back to me. But New Hampshire's in dire battle for their credit rating right now. And it was really amazing, because I, I did read that report yesterday, and I sent it to the state treasurer. And I said, see, if I'd have listened to the naysayers, we'd be having that article written about us. And so I'm very proud that we were able to maintain it, and I think it's going to get enhanced this year. We passed charter schools, and I want to talk a little bit about education because it's one of what I consider a failure. It's a failure from the standpoint that we weren't able to move choice ahead. We weren't able to convince everyone in Augusta that we need to put our students first because they're the future. They're not only the future of Maine, they're the future of our country, and we have to make sure they hit get the best possible education. This year there were four education bills in Augusta. I read them all. There was one sad thing about the four bills. The word student never showed up. And until we recognize that the future is in our kids, that we have to attract young people to Maine, as the rest of us are getting old. We are the oldest in the country, so we need to attract youth. But despite the broader failure of putting our students first, we did have some successes. And I'm going to tell you what I consider a success. <clears throat> Fort Kent High School has 80 students. They graduate a year. Back in 2011, <clears throat> Excuse me. Back in 2011, President Hess up at the University of Maine Fort Kent and I and the superintendent talked about a, uh, a pilot program. So what they did is they did a little lottery to put 25 kids, I mean put uh, eight all high school, the grade 10 uh, kids at Fort Kent, put them in a the hat, picked 24 names. And those kids were going to be put in an accelerated program and see how far they could go in the 11th and 12th grade. So they graduated these kids last spring, and I just want to give you the result of that class. One student completed a year and a half of, of college, plus a degree, uh, his diploma in high school. 17 kids completed the freshman year of college, plus their diploma. Six kids completed at least a semester of college, plus their diploma. And the only point here is that if we challenge our kids, they will deliver. So we just need to challenge them, put them first, put more money into the classroom. We put, I hear every day that I cut education. When John Baldacci was pre uh, the governor of Maine, when he, last year he left, he had $864 million to K through 12. That was the height of the state funding. This year, folks, in 2014, $973 million of general fund dollars and um, General assistance to education is going to the schools. 973 million from the state. 
That's not where the cuts are coming from. We are putting uh, money where our mouth is. The unions are saying we're not, but they're missing the boat. Kids are winning, kids are, uh, are the pawns and teachers are the pawns into a game where the superintendents and the unions are the winners. We have 127 superintendents for 185,000 kids. Florida has 2.7 million kids with 56 superintendents. Florida is kicking our you know what around. And the second, second language English speakers in Florida are one point behind Maine's verbals. One point. These are all kids that their primary language is Spanish. So we have a lot of work to do and we need to work together. This year we have $120 million investment going into Washington County for two new tissue machines. Next month, and I, I'm not going to announce it now because I'll jinx it, but I believe next month or the, or the following month there's going to be another major announcement for Washington County. So we're very, very pleased at what's happening. I'm going again to China here within the next 30 days. We've been asked to go meet with a board of directors. I think in China we call them, here we call them board of directors. I think China is a communist party. But they're very, very nice people that came and they're looking to invest in it. And uh, all I have to do is bring some red wine. And then we are working very, very hard on a couple of other projects. And the reason I'm talking about the economy right now is that's what it's all about. It's about jobs. And while you're going to hear a lot of people say that I'm against increasing the minimum wage, I'm really not. What I'm about is creating career jobs, career paying jobs. While they worry about minimum wage, I want to get career paying jobs. And so the paper machine in Washington County, we're talking 20 to $22 an hour. That's the kind of money we're looking at with full benefits. That's the kind of jobs I want. Those are valuable jobs. We've got 8,000 jobs right now on the job bank that we can't fill. Employers are telling me we can't find workers. And that's all over the state. So we really need to spend more, mon more money, more energy, in our K through 12 our community colleges so we can have our students prepared for the career jobs of the 21st century. GE, was, I, I was at a presentation from uh, Chairman Elmet and saying that if you're not in STEM now and you're not preparing your students for those jobs in the IT and the engineering and the math fields, you're going to be left behind. So I proposed an open for business zones. We wanted to have two in Maine, one in Brunswick at the base and one at Loring. And the whole idea was to try to attract a couple of large companies because as Chairman Emmelt told us, is for every job we create at GE, there's eight sub jobs in the support supply chain that are created. And that's what we're gonna do. We don't, we don't wanna have a dozen large corporations. If we had two and they create 16 companies on each end, that's a lot of people we're putting to work and they're higher paying jobs. So that's really where we want to go. So my program was, if you invest $50 million and you create 1,000 to 1,500 jobs, we're going to give you a free trade zone. It went down in flames. In fact, 
the president of the Senate, who's in the opposing party, said, we don't want jobs unless they're union jobs. So they killed it. But along with that, folks, along with killing that bill, he also killed the buying tree zones for Cumberland and York County. York County and Cumberland County are the only two counties in Maine that are no longer pine tree zones. Those expired. We tried to extend them to 2018 where the other 14 counties are going to have pine tree zones. And they're dead. Gone. Tried to revive them, couldn't get it done. That's the kind of gridlock it is. It's for this county. He is your senator, and there's so much hatred in, in, in Augusta that that's what happens. Because it was proposed by a Republican governor, it had no chance. The other thing that didn't have any chance, welfare fraud. Now, I really thought that we could all come together on one bill. I put up four bills. One bill was anybody on welfare would be asked to go to work. To go ask, not to go to work, sorry. We make an effort to look for work. Secondly, there's a loophole in the law that says anybody can have welfare in the state of Maine. All you have to say to the caseworker is you have good cause. And guess who defines good cause? The person, not the state. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing these strange looks. That's the way it is. And if that one doesn't work, you can. there's another piece in the law that says, if you have another good cause, bring that one up. If the first one doesn't work, then you have another good chance of getting it by another good cause. So I tried to re re remove that one. But the one that killed me, what I consider a no-brainer. And I, and, I, and I didn't even put everything I wanted into it. I left out guns and ammunition. I left out piercings, tattoos. I left that stuff out. Because I didn't want to make it controversial. <laughs> so I put in alcohol, tobacco, lottery tickets, bailing yourself out of jail. And strip joints. That one there, I, that, that's the one I think that tipped it. <laughs> it went down by party lines. Folks, it went down by party lines. Now, the reason I can stand here and talk about it is I lived it. I lived it. I know what it is to be caught in generational poverty. And everybody says that you give them more, give them more, give them more, and, and you'll solve the problem. We've been doing it since 1964. And look at how many, you can almost count them on your hands, how many of us got out. Because that's not how it works. It's an attitude, it's a mentality. You've got to inspire people to drive to get out. And we're not doing that if you send them a check every month. So we made a call. Mary Mayhew's people made a call to Florida this week. We had uh, one EBT card that over the last three years have spent $55,000 in Florida. So we asked them, where do you live? Florida. So we said, OK, you plan to come back to Maine? No. OK, click. Card gone. 55 grand back in the pot. It's unbelievable. So we got a little piece of software. It's amazing what you can get out of the data. I'll tell you just the five busiest cities where Mainers go to vacation. The Bronx, Brooklyn, Philadelphia, Las Vegas, and guess what, Disney World. 
Now, I have a friend who writes for the front page of the local paper who says that fraud is anecdotal. It's not a big deal. And the little bit of money that we save isn't really worth chasing. So $15 million per year of a 427, no, $457 million budget. $15 million is spent out of state every year. That's not a lot of money. But I've made two comments about that. One, first comment was, if it's not a lot of money, write me a check, I'll be out by noon. <laughs> I'm out of here. Secondly, a dollar bill is about six and a quarter inches. If you put them end to end, $15 million will bring you from my office in Augusta to Disney World in Orlando, Florida with some change. That's what fraud is. And the reason it's so important to go after is my next topic, nursing homes. We have two nursing homes that will be out of business by July 1st, and the legislature chose to leave. So I asked the minority party, the Republicans, to send a letter to the President and Speaker of the House to invite him back to discuss it. I found the money. I have found money to give to the nursing homes to keep them alive until July so that we can give them a small increase so they can stay alive, so we can take all this fraud money and put it to where it's needed, the elderly, the disabled, the mentally ill. They don't want to come back. So now I'm going to have to force them back. But you know, it's not, it shouldn't be that way, because we all know what happens when you force someone to do something. They don't do a good job if they don't want to do it. And that's the problem in Augusta. So we didn't get welfare fraud. We didn't get the nursing homes. So now we're putting pictures on EBT cards. They said, don't do it, but we're doing it anyways. The federal government was up this week and to Bangor, and they were going to come in and really razz the office. So I had somebody go up, and they're filming their visit. And they said, what are you doing? That's a little bit. I said, well, look, I don't want to have any misunderstandings. I want to have it on tape. Because in the last six months, the Portland Press Herald, or the I call it the, the uh, Pingree Gazette, but, <laughs> and listen, this, it might sound funny, but this is what's bad about it. My mail, the mail I get from the federal government, the mail that is mailed to me by the snail mail from the federal government is in the newspapers on the front page before the envelope gets to Augusta. That's something wrong with this kind of politics. Now, it's happened three or four different times. DHHS, anything from USDA and DHHS will end up in the Portland Press Herald before the letter gets to Augusta. We should be concerned, folks. We should all be concerned that kind of politics is going on. So drugs, I figured, okay, they don't want to fix welfare. They don't want, the, you know, the elderly, it's time to kick them to the curb. So surely they care about babies being born with drugs. They care that we are leading the country in overdoses per capita. Do you know in the state of Maine, we lose more people from old overdose of heroin than we lose in car accidents? First time, 2013. 927 babies a year. That's almost three a day. We're pushing three a day, a born addicted to drugs. So I said, fine, let's put together some more DEA agents because local law enforcement really have their hands full to try to take care of the, the, the level of drugs that are coming in. 
So I said, let's get some more DA agents. So I get some more judges, some more DAs. We can get through the court, the, the cases so that the civil cases, you know, everybody suing everybody can get into court. Because right now, criminal takes, it, takes precedent and there's a lot of drugs out. That went down in flames. Party line again. But let me tell you how serious an issue. 2012, we had 13 meth labs. 2013, we had 20 meth labs busted. After four months in 2014, 10 meth labs have been busted. They're rampant. Now they're even gone mobile. They're in trailers. They drive around town to town. We have an epidemic. Now, some say that this time of year, the Bronx and Brooklyn are nice places to visit. I'll leave it at that. So folks, the reason I bring this all up is we can make headway. And we can make headway with Democrats. And we can make headway with Republicans. But we cannot make headway with liberals. They do not want to move forward with us. We can't fix the drugs, we can't fix the nursing homes, and we can't fix the fraud until you send people that are interested and willing to work. And there are some great people here in the state. I mean, I don't know if any of you know Barry Hobbins. Barry Hobbins came down, we worked a deal, we had it all figured out on how we were gonna get some of this welfare and the drug issues taken care of. Went upstairs and he was shunned by his leadership. So as you look for governor, if you look for a state senator, legislature, what you need to do is hold their feet to the fire. Whether it's me, Mike, or Elliot, do not let them lie to you. I put a bill up, very innocuous bill. I just wanted to test the resolve of the legislature. This is the bill. A candidate for, pres uh, for governor, state senator, or legislature will not knowingly or deliberately lie to the main people. And the penalty is this. The penalty would go to the Ethics Commission and they do one of three things. It's either true, false, or can be distinguished. Because you know, some questions, you can, it could go either way. Went down in flying colors. It went down in flying colors without discussion. It was never amended. Lord knows that I send a bill, if it's got my name on it, it's usually blasted all over the, every committee and it's changed and there's all kinds of wording. It goes up two sentences, comes back down 12 pages. And this one here got no discussion and was killed in committee. So when you have that mentality that you cannot stand up, and be honest, despite whether you like it, if he uses the right verbs, adjectives, or if he's smooth or not smooth, be cautious of a real slick politician. I will tell you that. Because we as people need to demand honesty. We demand being forthright. We need, it's okay to say I vetoed Medicaid expansion five times this year. Five different Medicaid expansion bills I vetoed. Why? Because Maine was being punished by the federal government for having expanded in 2002. People think that we are getting 100%. We weren't getting 100%. All between 100 and 138% of poverty, we would get 100%. Anyone below 100% of poverty, got, we get 61.5%. If any of you have been reading the papers, again, Rhode Island is going through some real rough times right now.
They expanded Medicaid with the intention of having 29,000 people sign up. In the first four months, actually the first three months, 68,000 people signed up. They're $51 million in the hole. And the, one, the 100,000 people that they wanted to expand, half of them are on the exchange and have insurance now. Because they weren't the ones falling through the cracks. There are some problems, but we expanded in 2002, so we're being penalized. And so with that, we need to get everybody we possibly can into the system getting insurance and then fight at the federal level to solve the problem. We filed suit against Obamacare. We're trying to get in back to the Roberts Court to get a clarification. And if we get that clarification, we're going to be big winners in the state of Maine because they're saying that Robert said that you did not have to expand Medicaid, and if you did, your Medicaid could not be impacted by the federal government, but it is in Maine. So we're suing them, saying, if you, go, if, if you can go up, you sh certainly should be able to come down. They're saying, no, you can move forward, but you can't move backwards. And so we're challenging that decision. If we win that decision, folks, then we will no longer be penalized. That's the reason we're going for it. Unfortunately, I had to go out and find my own lawyer because the AG wouldn't fight the bill. Down party lines again. It's that whole issue of party lines. So this is what I ask you all. Just hold their feet to the fire. Demand that what they campaign on is what they work on. Because I had one politician tell me, oh, that's just campaign rhetoric. Nobody expects you to do that. So really, when they campaign, hold their feet to the fire. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Governor uh, Michael Foley from the city of Westbrook over here. Right. I appreciate your uh, continued investment in education. But one of the areas of concern for our local municipalities is the continued um, volatile area of municipal revenue sharing. And what is your plan to continue to, uh, to deal with that area so it's not uh, thrown on the backs of the property taxpayers? Well, let's, let, let me tell you what I think about revenue sharing. First of all, revenue sharing, if it's fully funded, it's $150 million. It's never been fully funded, okay? It's been funded to $90 million. I reduced it from $90 million to $60 million. 60 million, let me tell you how much revenue sharing amounts to. Property taxes in the state of Maine generate $2.3 billion. The state gives the communities another over $100 million in education, in GA, in roads, and everything else. So now we got $3.3 billion. I reduce it $30 million on $3.3 billion and everybody's having a heart attack. It's less than four-tenths of 1% in the, in the scheme of the whole state. Now, I looked at a couple of towns. One happens to be Waterville because I know the numbers there very well. It's less than half a percent, their, their share. Gardner said, oh, because the governor's cut of revenue share, we're going to have to increase our taxes 8%. That sounds drastic. That was the headline. <laughs> you know, like I, I didn't read it. I was told that, so <laughs> I don't read the newspaper. So we did the math. Revenue sharing was 0.5, one half of 1%. 7.5% was true growth. So let me go back in history and say, well, how did revenue sharing evolve? This is how it evolved. Property taxes were going up about 20 years ago. So the MMA came to the government and said, you know, you've got to slow the growth of property taxes. So give us some of your money. Okay, that sounds a little bit like community welfare to me. 
But let me tell you this. When I was in Waterville, I went to Winslow, Oakland, and Fairfield and said, let's work together. Instead of having four property uh, tax assessors, four public works directors, four superintendents, four police chiefs, four fire chiefs, and four town managers, why don't we work together? Like Lewiston, because that population of those four towns is 36,000. Lewiston's 36,000. So instead of 24 administrators, let's get down to six. They said no, because they like local control. Local control equals revenue sharing. And frankly, I will tell you what I'm gonna do with revenue sharing next year. Instead of giving it to the towns, so the towns can spend it, I'm gonna do it to reduce local property taxes directly to the homeowner. That way there, revenue sharing does what it's supposed to do, lower taxes. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm, my name is Eric. I'm from a Southern Maine Community College. I uh, supported you in 2010. I was old enough, uh, and I continue, uh, plan on continuing my support. Don't say it too loud. Don't say it too loud. <laughs> um, my question for you is I write for our uh, school newspaper, and I was wondering if I could conduct an interview with you because I think it's important for our students to know what's going on. And Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. And matter of fact, if you can't come up to Augusta to do it, I'll come down. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Because little known, I actually started a newspaper, believe it or not. When I was at Hudson College, I started the college newspaper. And do you know what it was for? At that, see, I'm French, so I didn't really know how to write too much in English. So the reason I started a newspaper is I could get local advertising to pay for it, and I could get a stipend. <laughs> Pretty smart, right? <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. My name is Justin Duchesne, and I'm a student with Youth Build Alternatives in Portland, Maine. Uh, I agree with you that our public school system has failed. Um, I am currently a student at Learning Works, and I have been with programs such as Josh Maine's graduates in Portland, Maine. My question, Governor, is how are you going to make sure that more uh, schools have the access to Josh Maine graduates? Well, I'll tell you. You want to ensure, <laughs> you said nonpartisan, right, Bill? Sorry. <laughs> I put money in to Josh Maine graduates the last two years. It's cut by the Democrats. I'm sorry, but that's a fact. I am a major believer and sponsor of Josh Maine graduates. I think it's one of the few really good, successful programs that truly goes and looks for mentors to educate our kids. And I think mentors are more valuable than anything else in a person's life. So I'm with you 100%. The only way you can guarantee it is to have a Republican governor, House, and Senate. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry, way over there. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Chris Wazaleski from Ocean View at Falmouth in the Highlands of Thompson. And I uh, just wanted to ask you a question. Um, since you highlighted Maine as the oldest state in the Union by demographics, um, what are you doing um, or what is your plan for your second term uh, or uh, in terms of your campaign policy on affordable senior housing? and on uh, promoting more affordable senior housing in the state of Maine, assuming it's a need area. Okay, that is a priority at the Maine State Housing right now. Bill Gallagher came in and there are two priorities that he's been given. One is uh, senior housing, elderly housing, both in independent living, assisted living, and uh, the final step is nursing home. But he is gonna concentrate on, on the independent and, and um, assisted living area, so it's very important. But not only that, that's, that's one step. That takes care of the older population, but it's not good enough to just say take care of the elderly. 
what we want to do the next session is I want to do what Utah has done. They are the youngest state and union at 29 years old. Median age, 29. So that says that we need more children and more young adults. And what I want to do in the next session, in my, my second term, is to encourage people to move to Maine. And we'll have a program that if you come to Maine and you have student loans, that we will help pay for them over a five to seven year period. So if you come to Maine and you study here in Maine and you live in Maine, we will help you pay your student loans off. I believe that is a major incentive to young people today in America because student loans are one of the fastest growing areas of our economy. And unfortunately, not only do they have high costs of education, high costs of insurance, high costs of living conditions, we need to work with them to try to lower that so they can have prosperity much early in life. Because when, when you get prosperous at my age, you can't enjoy it. <laughs> get too many aches and pains. Do I want to open the rule rail? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. My name's Paul. Oh, Your Honor, wow. I own and operate a business in the greater Portland area with my wife, United Obligations. Maine currently ranks 49th out of the 50 states in the union in job creation. I'd say, sir, it's more than a problem. There's your epidemic. What help can we as business people count on from you, from the government of Maine, to assist us in hiring people, incentives to hire people, to put people, we want to help you, but what help can we expect from you? Well, <laughs> jobs for Maine graduates is one example of that is money that is put into the schools so that the schools can help get people with the skill sets necessary to do the current jobs. STEM education, the whole area of STEM education is to get students ready to do main jobs. We have 8,000 jobs right today as I speak to you and we can't find the skill sets to get people to do the jobs. I will. I do agree with what you're saying. We have a skills gap in our workforce. But I will disagree with you when you say that we're 49th in the country. We are not 49th in the country. Matter of fact, folks, right now, as I speak to you, we have the number two most aggressive, fastest growing economy in the United States of America. There's only one state that's ahead of us, and that's North Dakota, and they have a lot of oil. <laughs> so. The issue is, how do we better prepare our kids, K through 12, to go on to community college or the university without having to spend a year to a year and a half in remedial work to learn the trade skills they need for the jobs? 54% of every high school student who graduates who wants to go on to community college needs remedial work. 25% of all kids that graduate in Maine that want to go on to the university level have to take remedial work. The school system is failing us. Now, we do have many incentives, and we're working with the Department of Labor to try to get some waivers to allow us to use some of our uh, monies to help people, in other words, to help people get into jobs and learn the jobs. Let's say if you pay someone seven, $15 an hour, we're trying to get a waiver from the federal government that would allow us to pay $7.50 of that labor while they're learning the jobs. Let's say 90, 120 days. So you could hire them, pay them half, you pay half, we pay half, you do the teaching, and we're subsidizing the learning. But it's very difficult to get Washington to move forward. There, there's some good things happening, but it's slow. The other thing that we're doing is we have four what they call uh, workforce investment boards, four of them in the state. I've tried to bring it to the state level, 
because most states only have one. We decided to have four. We get about $10 million a year. So I, we dug in to see how much of the $10 million gets into actual tr job training, 2.8 million. 7.2 million was for overhead. So I said, no more. I got a board, all volunteers, community college, administration people, University of Maine people, many business people. And we have engaging with the chambers saying, you tell us what you need in your area, we will put the money in for the training in your area to get those people trained. And the federal government denied our waiver. We've got a second waiver in. We've adjusted a few things, hoping that they will approve it this summer. But that's exactly what we're trying to do, is get money into the, into the workplace to do the training and not these nonprofits who spend all the money for administration. So those are some of the things we're trying to do. Some people talk about tax incentives. The problem with a tax incentive is you have to make the money you have to have the profit before you can pay the tax. So it's not an incentive if you're not making money. Governor, we have time for one last question. To your right, Betsy. Thank you. Hello, Governor LePage. Betsy Knight Barnard, retired GE executive. All right. Currently bringing jobs to Maine. I've embarked on a new career in real estate. And uh, it's been most interesting to be an entrepreneur in Maine. I came here for education. My sons are reaping the benefits of great education at Falmouth High School currently. A school, by the way. Yes. And I just saw the grades. So is I got Cumberland a and so is Yarmouth and so are many others yes. too, not to leave yeah. anybody out. Um, what I'd like to ask you about in your presentation, it sounds like our two-party system is broken. What are two things that the people in this room who are leaders in commerce could do when they go back to their work today to make a difference and break up the loggerhead that you mentioned in your presentation? Two things you can do. One of them, as I've already mentioned, is hold their feet to the fire. Demand. You elect them. They want to run. You elect them. They ask you to elect them. Then demand they do the job. Just demand they do the job. You insist that they do the job. Get to a decision. Frankly, I want to bring them back. I want to get money to the nursing homes. They don't want to come back. Now, I can force them back, but like I said, forcing them is not going to do anything. So they should want to come back and do it. The money's there. We've identified it. We've identified money for, for judges, for DEA agents, for uh, uh, DAs. All they have to do is vote up or down. Up or down at least gives you an answer so that you can make a decision when you go to the polls. So that's one thing. The other thing is you only reap what you sow. And if you send them there, then you got to get it. You just need to talk to them and insist they do the job. You know, everybody's so quick at blaming the other. And I, I, there's no question. People say, well, why don't you meet with them? I do. I've had four meetings with them. In two years, four meetings, I called them all. When I have something on my mind, I call them. They come down, they have yet to call me. Now members of the opposing party have called me. As I mentioned one, Barry Hobbins has called me. Uh, there's a lady from Sanford Boland and calls me all the time. <laughs> She's in at least once a week. Uh, so th there are many, many individuals that will call you. It's the leadership. It's not the individuals. The individuals that go to Augusta are all good people. It's when they work as a group, they become a mob. So what you have to do is insist that they represent you the way that they said they would. They need to hold, you need to hold their feet to the fire. And right now in, in, uh, in Augusta, I will say this. There's some great Republicans, there's some great uh, Democrats. The problem is not in those two groups. The problem is we have ideologues that are progressives and liberal. There, there's nothing that we can do. And, and on our side, 
we have a couple that are libertarian that, I mean, short of, uh, I don't know what to do with them, but, but, they're the, but they're the outskirts. They really are. They're, they're the, on the fringes. The problem is when the fringe is the leaders, you have a problem. And that's what we have in Maine right now. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Great job. Thank you. Well, we thank the governor for his comments and for his bipartisan bashing. Uh, fascinating, fascinating remarks. And, uh, and, and as, as a thank you uh, to the governor for speaking today, we'll be making a donation in your honor to the MDA. Some final announcements as we wrap up. You can stay up to date on everything related to the chamber by connecting via Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Stay tuned to the Chamber's website for video of this morning's eggs and issues, and as always, the photos taken here this morning will be available for viewing on the Chamber's Facebook page and on their website. Thanks so much for coming this morning. We hope to see you again on June 4th, when we will welcome Portland School Superintendent Emmanuel Cobb. Thanks, and have a great day.